What's up, everybody? This is the Rogue Jedi here. So this episode is actually going to be split in two. This is part one. Yeah, things kind of, we kind of went wilding out for this episode, especially in terms of Endor. So, hey, that's more extra content for, for y'all to listen to. So, hey, feel free to binge it. So here we are with part one. All right, we are here. We are here, peoples. Um, I uh, let's just say that things are things have popped off recently, and I I have to, I have to ask you all if you were out in space and you you had to come across there there was like a vial or like three vials of a virus that had to break out, and you're forced to take one of them <laughs> to to infect all of the people on the ship with. Which one would it be? Would it be the pretty much xenomorph eggs would you want a, a the black wing virus from star wars aka death troopers or would you want necromorphs from dead space mm, that's a good one i definitely wouldn't want the chest bursters because that's the end of it um but I'll go with the Dead Space uh, necromorphs because I, I feel like if you can focus on the tentacles you have a chance so I'm gonna roll with that. Oh man, uh, I'm not sure that I know what some of these things are. Um, so I don't know. I guess the the Star Wars one. Sure, let's go with that one. Mm, mm, a perfect, perfect. I see, I'm, I, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I mean, I was also gonna go with the the Death Troopers because at least that one would uh see the chest bursters. I mean, <clears throat> no. No, just just <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> just kill me right. Just kill me right before it happens, because I'm not about to get taken out like that. Necromorphs is a definite no because I ain't trying to get mutated. <laughs> at, at least, at least the Death Troopers, you you're still mostly human, or at least humanoid, because <laughs> at least enough. And plus, hive mind and all that good jazz. So hey, it, it, and plus it's a sickness, so there's at least a chance for a cure. <laughs> my too. That's a good one. Death. Yes. So kicking off, I'm Demetrius. And I'm Demetrius. And Meach Meach presents the Blurred City Podcast. So we are back from our thanks post Thanksgiving hiatus. It was just a good time to not be editing and recording. Yes, we were definitely eating. Uh just chill, get our minds right before just ending the year on a high note and then kicking off into 2023. So this is our Andor review. And in order to do it, we talked about it. We were like, yo, we have the perfect guest to get this on. So we have another guest this week, Jamie, our good friend. Hello. Yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, if you're listening, just go ahead for uh, housekeeping purposes, like subscribe, you know, give us rating comments or whatever. But again, we're going to be talking, getting into our Andor review and it's going to be super hype. Might be a super episode because, you know, I think we're going to get really excited for it. So before we get into it, let's hit that legal spiegel. All right. So the purpose of this podcast is to explore digital and print media. All sources we reference are owned by the respective companies and our thoughts and agendas are strictly our own and do not reflect any biases or corporate agendas. Your discretion is advised. All right. So post Thanksgiving, everyone's been in the kitchen. We're about to get to what's hot. I don't know about y'all, but like the past week, so many things have popped off just like in terms of hype trailers uh different announcements so like what's hot to you what have y'all just seen recently that's been really cool all righty uh okay well let's let's go ahead and get this out of the way right now uh the anime scene is is, is super hot right now honestly bleach has gone completely <laughs> out of pocket chainsaw man even more out of pocket I don't know what else to say. The it, it's out of pocket, but Mob Psycho still hilarious as always. Not my, last episode, <laughs> except for last episode. Uh, my hero popping off. All right, One Piece is still One Piecing. It's still doing its thing. Um, and and of course, 
blue lock is happening in real life so uh yes. I, I i don't i don't know what else to say like it <laughs> But the anime has transcended reality and has become <laughs> become real. But <laughs> but in terms of the gaming scene, ooh, some many big releases have just uh, come out. We got ourselves Marvel Midnight Suns, which mm-hmm. just dropped, or at least at the recording of this episode, dropped yesterday. We have ourselves Hello Neighbor 2, nice ooh. little little platform horror game. We got an announcement for Amnesia the Bunker. Oh. Yes, a, another sequel to that acclaimed horror game. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm ready. And then the game that has been taking up uh, a lot of my sleep lately, a game that I've been playing so much that I am that I may be contemplating uh, just never going out into space at all, the Callisto Protocol. A nice little spiritual successor to the Dead Space franchise. <laughs> That's why I mentioned it in the in the quick catch up. But uh-huh. yes, it's it's wild. There's just mm, mm, the, the game is scrumptious, but I gotta sell it, tell it to you guys straight. The I'm more stressed out in that game trying to manage my inventory <laughs> than I am fighting all of the infected in that game. Which I don't know how to feel about that. That's <laughs> that's kind of wild. That OCD kicking up. <laughs> too too much. Too much. <laughs> but yes, right. that's what I had. All right, Jamie, what do you have? Um, well, we've got some new trailers that dropped recently for some things. So the Guardians of the Galaxy 3 trailer is out, which got some interesting little tidbits in it. So really curious to see where where they take this movie in that direction gamora's back as we see from mm-hmm. the trailer so that's exciting um, and we got a little yeah little glimpse of adam warlock in there mm-hmm. so there's some cool things and then some apparently companion of rocket that's in there so there's some really interesting kind of details that they've got i'm really scared from rocket i saw really from death flags <laughs> i'm really scared for him yes. in this movie <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah well and there's okay there was a moment i didn't go back and like slow it down to double check but it almost looks like they're carrying either an unconscious or a dead peter quill at one point too so i'm not really sure yeah. what's what's going on in the mix there but that looks like it could be interesting mm-hmm. um there's a new indiana jones trailer so regardless of how you kind of feel about the new indiana jones kind of most recent film that came out i know lots of people didn't like it quite as much as the originals but there is a new Indiana Jones movie coming out, and we have a trailer. Um, and we also finally have a release date for Mandalorian season three. So that's March exciting. March We're going to get to that later, but yes. Mm-hmm. All right. And just to continue, Transformers Rise of the Beast trailer dropped. I, I got goosebumps from a Transformers movie for like, Bumblebee was really good. It didn't give me like um, goosebump vibes because it was coming off like two like mid movies and but bumblebee was like a good resurgence and resetting of the franchise rise of the beast the way the uh transformers were transforming wow is was like literally gave me goosebumps also there's this one trailer that i'm definitely gonna go see this movie it's called cocaine bear yeah (laughs) yes a bear on cocaine (laughs) Oh, no. Based on a real life event in 1985, Canada. <laughs> yes. So I'm definitely going to go see that now because that was hype. And also, another thing that we missed, uh, I'm surprised nobody mentioned this one either. There was a, another trailer that came out and it made me question all of reality. Uh, so we know about the Winnie the Pooh horror movie, right? <laughs> Yes, I know what you're talking what? about. I know what you're you know about the about. Winnie the Pooh. There, yes, there's a horror movie based on Winnie the Pooh. Yes, Winnie Man. the Pooh has gone to complete murder. Blood but, and honey. But there's another one. Another one that dropped. And now I'm questioning all of humanity. And I'm forced to go watch it because <laughs> it it combines two holidays. It combines Christmas and combines hor- Halloween and horror. They released a horror movie trailer for The Grinch. What? The mean one. <laughs> yes. Oh no. <laughs> yes. The Grinch has now become a horror movie. And I have no choice but to watch it. There's I don't know how to feel. I have to see it because now my curiosity has been peaked beyond comprehension. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. How are you gonna steal Christmas? Oh, I know how by dropping bodies. That's how you're gonna steal Christmas. 
all the boys and girls who've been good this year, instead of getting presents, you get blood. And instead of coal for the naughty kids, you get rolling heads. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Just like that. He, he sends appendages to the nice kids to warn them, like, hey, I, this is what's coming for you. If I, 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 I don't even know anymore. Oh, man. This is That's the state bad. of movies we are in right now. Oh, no. That public domain is, is a real thing. All right. Uh, so, yeah, this is definitely going to turn into a mega episode. But just one more trailer to cover the official Super Mario Brothers or, yeah, Super Mario Brothers movie trailer actually came out. We got a lot of reveal for a lot of different characters. Still waiting for Yoshi. Um, so just with that, now that we covered everything that's what hot, we're going to get into our guest, our aficionado on Star Wars. Uh I'm going to do a mini introduction to meet you. You can finish it up. But I just know, Jamie, the first time we all met, uh, I literally mentioned Star Wars just at, at the table. And it's like a light bulb in your head went off. <laughs> you went to the rest of the table. You went, hold on. I'm having a conversation over here. But I'm coming back to Star Wars. And we're going to get into it. <laughs> so, yeah, Meech, if you even want to cover that. Oh, oh, man. And unfortunately, I wasn't there for that part of the conversation. I came like slightly later. But hey, but yes, now is the time our, we introduced our esteemed guests. So, Jamie, tell the good peoples out here on the Internet who you is, what what you into, what you what you all about. <laughs> OK, well, hello there. Um, I'm Jamie. Uh, I'm from the Pacific Northwest, so I'm from quite a ways away from our lovely Blurred City pod host down in Houston. Um, but gosh, who am I? I'm currently a medical student. I was formerly a student athlete, so that's taken up a lot of my life and a lot of my time over the years and recently. Um, yeah, in terms of like nerd dumb and that related things, I feel like I Star Wars was kind of the biggest and first thing. For me, my parents introduced us to it when I was in elementary school. So I was about four years old when um, George Lucas started rolling out the prequel trilogy. So uh, 1999, I was four. So um, we, I don't remember exactly when we kind of got introduced to these things, but my parents started with the original trilogy. So we watched all of that. I think, I think the first and second um prequel movies were out at that point because i know that revenge of the sith wasn't out yet only because when i was in fourth grade i had friends that were like super excited that they got to go to the midnight premiere or whatever so i know it was before that but anyway so star wars was the first like really big thing i was introduced to um i also grew up on like the chronicles of narnia read the books saw the movies that was really great um but a lot of like the big, big nerd things I didn't get into until I was maybe older, like high school, um, college, that kind of stuff, um, except for Pirates of the Caribbean that I was on when I was young, too. Um, but anyway, so then when I got into um, like later high school and college, um, my brother especially got me into Lord of the Rings. So that's always great. Um, I will say that I had a different favorite book. And then as soon as I read The Lord of the Rings, that was like, hands down, this is the best book I've ever read. So major plug for that if you've never read the lord of the rings it's i know that it's tedious but like it's it's a fantastic book i love it um gosh yeah at this point i don't know what i'm not into super into marvel so my marvel story actually seeing captain america the first avenger totally changed how i see movies um which when i say that basically i had just started driving um so this must have come out like right after i turned 16 and so this was the first movie like i drove myself to and i went to and i was like oh this looks kind of interesting i think we had seen iron man we had seen the other movies that were out but captain america was in theaters so i went and saw it and i went to like the 10 p.m at night like showing a few weeks after it came out i was the only one in the theater so it was like perfect sat in the middle of the back the movie was amazing just the whole experience i was like whoa First of all, I'm going to do this all the time now. So then the 10 p.m. showing like became my favorite show to go watch. So that's kind of how I saw every movie after that. But like that's what really got me into the MCU was Captain America, the first Avenger. So, of course, Steve Rogers is my personal favorite if we're talking, you know, Marvel characters. Although that's like he's my favorite character. Although if I was going to like be a Marvel character, of I'd of course choose either Wanda or Jean Grey. Those are favorites. So love the X-Men too. all of that kind of whole Marvel universe that's going on. Um, 
what other characters? Gosh, um, Star Wars characters. I do have to say um, Padme has been my favorite for a super long time. Lots of love for her. She's a super important character. Um, Anakin got got a soft spot for my boy Anakin. Always, always a favorite. Um, so yeah, I have some extended universe favorite characters there too. So Jaina Solo is actually one of my favorite oh. characters. So I have a whole lot of opinions on my disappointment in the sequel trilogy, mostly because I really wanted to see Jada Solo and they decided to, you know, do the Disney thing. So I have a whole side feel on that that I won't go into. But anyway, so yeah, so I just, I fell in love with the stories. Um, I fell in love with just the way that, I don't know, yeah, the characters kind of speak to you in a way. And then, yeah, I think there's, there's certain movies like Star Wars for me, honestly, was a movie that there was challenging things going on in my life at the time and like kind of turn to some of that stuff to help emotionally get me through it so I think that's part of my bond with Star Wars but anyway um so what am I into now um well everything Star Wars related obviously <laughs> um since there's a whole lot of that going on and I'm super 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 stoked for Ahsoka that's like the thing I'm most excited about right now um so I think that's going to be like their next big thing. But yeah, in terms of like right now, I mean, I feel like I'm kind of between shows right now because everything I'm watching either has finished its most recent season or we're in the anticipation period of what's coming. So I mentioned Ahsoka. Obviously, there's the next season of The Mandalorian that's coming out. The Acolyte actually looks really interesting. I know we're getting into all this later, so I won't say much about it. But those kind of are the three Star Wars things that are tops on my list. Tales of the Jedi was really, really good. Um, I know it was kind of a bunch of mini episodes, but like lots of love for that. Um, house of the dragon was really good really really liked that first season so excited to see where they go from there um gosh what else there's loki season two i think is either coming or in production or whatever so that's kind of the marvel tv show i'm looking forward to um other than that i just started watching sandman recently um because i heard good things about that so um I've only I'm only like one episode into it, but it seems really interesting so far. So excited to see where that goes. And then uh, Wednesday, the new Adam's Family show. I, I want to watch that. Super, yeah. yeah, wanting to get Lately. into. It. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Oh, um, and just did do you feel any like pushback in nerddom growing up? And just like since you just explained everything you're into, why'd you never leave it? Yeah. So I I was kind of like a closet Star Wars fan, I would say for a while. Um, it wasn't until I was high in high school that I like really like was like, nah, I'm just gonna be very outwardly Star Warsy about it. And I don't know that it was necessarily that I got pushback because I mentioned, you know, I had like friends that were super into it when we were young. Um, I think I don't well, the only like thing I could maybe state that's pushbacky is like, you know, sometimes when you're really excited about things and people aren't, they kind of give you that, oh, that's nice kind of type of response. So that can be kind of discouraging. But that's that's kind of the only pushback I've had with it. Um, and I will say the other side of things is because I was a student athlete for most of my life, that took up most of my time and energy. So I wasn't as much like super into the nerd things when I was younger. But yeah, I feel like once you get older, people are like, yeah, do your thing, whatever. So that was kind of my experience. That makes sense. Dope. So now, listeners, we are about to hop in our spaceships, finally leave the sands of Tatooine and prepare for our Andor TV series review. So with this, this is our longest uh, show that we've had to review since it's 12 episodes. So we ended up breaking it into four different arcs, um, explaining it uh, 12 episodes, so essentially three episodes per arc, except for the final one. Um, So starting with the first one, I'm gonna uh, let y'all kick it off, but it's the Corpo Luthen intro and Escape from Ferrix art. So anything uh, else that people need to know before we actually dive deep into it? Uh, yeah, so essentially, like, this show, Andor, is, of course, kind of a prequel to the movie uh, Rogue One. And essentially, you get to learn more about the ca- character of Cassian Andor, a character who, uh, I guess, many people gravitated to, to uh, wanted to learn more about, so much so that you created a whole show dedicated to him that got two whole seasons, but... uh. But yeah, so like this is this is different from your prototypical uh, Star Wars show or any other property, much like Rogue One was completely different as well. So you're going to get a lot of those uh, 
those feelings and uh, a- attitude and mood and tone throughout the entire show. So if you haven't watched it, uh, I'm a- I advise you right now, leave. <laughs> yes, it's a perfect binge too. All right, uh, so y'all can kick off the how we get started. All right, Jamie, you want to kick off with the uh, with the 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 Ferrix arc or one through three? Okay, so we start in this show. Um which is really interesting. And I'll kind of pause for a quick side note where we start and where we finish is really interesting to kind of see the progression. So we start meeting um, cash in and we're showing up on, I think it's more Lana one um, mm-hmm. is the planet we zoom into. And they kind of give us a timestamp that this is um, five years before the battle of Yavin. So timeline, what that means is we're five years before basically episode four, which means we're 15 years after, well, 14 to 15 years after Revenge of the Sith. So we're 14 to 15 years into the Empire, really 14, um, because Battle of Yavin is 19 years afterwards. Anyway, um, so that's kind of where we're sitting in this timeline, which also puts us probably about five years before the events of Rogue One. So we are first introduced to Cashin, who's this kind of mysterious character who shows up and he comes into this establishment um, looking for... He says a canary female is what he's looking for. And basically we find out he's looking for his sister. And so again, we have cash in. We're not really sure where he's at in this timeline other than he's just looking for his sister. And so he gets into this kind of scruff with these two security dudes that look like they have nothing better to do than cause problems. And he ends up killing them. Uh Oh, and then flees the scene and goes back to Ferrix, which is where we find out that he's been living um, for whatever time period that he's been around um i will say i feel like the star wars shows that we've gotten lately are kind of they've all been kind of slow starters um for my opinion and so this kind of opening arc takes a while i feel like to really get somewhere and so um but there is kind of a lot of building that goes into that so we kind of flash back and forth between like flashbacks to andor's childhood and to present day which again is five years before the battle of yavin and so when we flash back to his childhood there's this basically indigenous kind of group of children basically is what they look like that are existing on this planet. Um, And it kind of slowly pieces together that there was this ship that crashed on their planet. And then you kind of have these kids go investigate the ship and it looks like it's probably some kind of mining colony type situation. And then the kids go investigate again, this like ship that crashed and then their leader ends up getting shot. And there's like this whole like scene that's made about it. Um, Anyway, and then basically what ends up happening is Marva, who's another main character in the show, um, she and her husband Clem end up taking cash in and basically raising him as their son. Um, And so that's kind of the side flashback story that's going on. And then as we kind of flash back and forth between that and present day, we see Cass seems to have a habit of getting himself into trouble. He owes a bunch of people money. So there's some people that kind of try to shake him down for this money. Um, But he realizes that he has done messed up when he went and killed these security guards. And so he's trying to come up with a plan to flee really quick. So he has this Mm -hmm. apparently thing that he stole from a naval shipyard in a different area right that he tries to sell to this guy that a friend knows basically it's Mm -hmm. kind of this whole convoluted he doesn't really have connections to this person but his friend bix has connections to this other guy that apparently is really interested in meeting him and so he tries to he think like okay this is my shot to like get the money that i need and get out and just kind of run away from the situation for a while uh that's kind of Cass's identity really at the beginning here is he's a runner yeah Um, yeah. so anyway Uh, that's kind of where where we end up in this beginning Mm -hmm. Uh, yep yep so and then we get introduced to uh to a man that needs no further introduction (laughs) to the a man that everyone on this podcast loves dearly cyril karn Uh, the the perfect the perfect example of mess around and find out (laughs) yeah because (laughs) oh boy all right so of course he works for the same security firm that these two that the two uh now formerly alive uh <laughs> formerly alive officers were a part of and mm-hmm. and essentially he's kind of your by the book no he's literally a by the books uh officer you know mm-hmm. his his uh, his a uh, boss right he was like hey all right so these two people they're corrupt this is just a uh 
like this was a robbery gone wrong, which like that's what he was suspecting it to be. And it was like, yeah, that mm-hmm. literally was that literally was exactly, what happened. Exactly what it was. The, the two officers, they also learned the important concepts so of mess around and find out. Um and and he's like, Yeah, we'll just sweep it under the rug, we'll cause no further problems. But uh but unfortunately Sarel's like, nah, nah. As soon as you leave on your bi- Yep, as long as you leave on your business trip, we going full toe into finding out who did this. I'm going to cause it whole types of pa- all types of pandemonium just to just to find all this out. And over the course of these first three episodes, he finds out like, all right, so this person was in Ferrix. He also gets accompanied by a uh, <laughs> by his little gremlin on the side. <laughs> and so they all get to Ferrix, right? At the same time that the the seller, the benefactor, pops in, like wanting to meet up with Cashin. Cashin, of course, has the uh the the device. He also tells uh Big Mama Marva that like, hey, I'ma go sell this. With, who's accompanied by a pretty fantastic droid, a uh, nice little loyalty droid right there. I'm I I I also kind of want him. Uh, <laughs> like I want every continuing single the droid. tradition of great Star Wars droids. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. No, there were no misses when it comes to the droids, uh, even the murder ones. And <laughs> and then he he's like he go, he goes to try to meet with the benefactor. But at the same time, oh, old buddy Cyril, our favorite guy, him and a whole battalion of cops decide to roll up in Ferrix to try to say, hey, we know this guy is here. Mm-hmm. Where is he? And we promise nothing will uh will come of harm to any of you. And also, can we just take a moment to appreciate just how realistic and how uh very timely that 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 kind of looked, you know? All the cops just rolling into a into a town, basically pretending that they own the place, and all of the citizens were just like, nah, nah, we we don't buy, we do not respect your authority. Yeah, it's about their <laughs> final podcast, yeah. I see. Oh, I oh we yes. Need to, we need to add here really quick, too. This is another character I wasn't the biggest fan of. So Bix is Andor's friend, clearly. And she has this very jealous, untrusting male <gasps> friend. Yes. Who is the entire reason that these Morlana One doofuses show up to Ferrix in the first place like oh, I he wrapped out cash in because he's jealous and untrusting of Bix and what she's doing um mm. even though she's just trying to help her friend cash in um and he ends up dead for it so I mean like dude yes. again mess around and find out that seems um, to be like the motto of the story <laughs> I'm so glad that we brought you on because I forgot about Tim so this was another oh, message to the people mm-hmm. if your relationship is it if both people don't understand the dynamics of the relationship and you don't have a third factor like tim he thought that cassian was the third factor Mm -hmm. um you might need to straighten that out because somebody gonna start acting shady and (laughs) look what happened so yeah yeah so just with that uh to speed along this arc it really picks up episode three uh the first two episodes for me when i was watching it i don't know about um your reactions but it was like, okay, it's slow. I can kind of understand. And then when episode three happened, I was like, I got to watch every episode of this. Like, this is must see TV. So essentially one of the best scenes and one of the best choreographed fights is when we meet Luthen um, with Cassian and they have that fight in like the warehouse and like the chains are falling and shooting. Like mm-hmm. I haven't seen anything done like that in the Star Wars show. And we see that he, uh, Luthen really doesn't care about the device that much. Like he'll take it if he wants to. But he really wants Cassian because he was able to steal the device. So he wants, he essentially at the time says he's recruiting heroes or essentially just people to help him with his um, rebellion that we start to learn. So kind of wrapping up that arc, Cyril, Cyril, however you want to say his name, completely messes up. People will get bodied left and right. Um, He gets stripped, demoted. And then we, at the time, we also start to finally see the Imperials and they're like, Yo, you messed this up. We taken over. So that leads us into, ooh, my second favorite arc because the one after it is so elite. But yeah. the Aldani heist arc and the birth of the rebellion arc. So if y'all want to go with that, yeah. So yeah, and again, as as my earlier comment, I feel like 
just slow, slow starters here. Um, I felt like the the pacing of the all dawning arc like allowed them to build a lot, but I was kind of like, okay, can we get to it? Can we get to it? Let's get to the heist. But anyway, so we have this situation where basically, again, Cass needs to run. He needs to escape Ferrix because people are chasing him. So Luthen takes him and brings him to this other place that we learn is called Aldani. And basically, he gives Cass this option that he's like, okay, here's what I want you to do. If you do this job for me, I will pay you, I think it's like 200,000 credits or something like that. But you have to do the job, basically. And on top of that, uh, when I bring you to this place, these people are not going to like it either. So you're going to have to let me talk them into it. So they're already not going to want you to be there, but mm -hmm. you know, you're going to have to earn their trust and then, you know, join this team to go do this mission successfully that you don't really have any of the specs of how dangerous it really is. Other than he tells you that you're stealing the payroll for an entire sector, which is like a massive deal. So they show up to this planet and then we have this new character that shows up that we learn is named Belle. We don't really know anything about her because this is the first time she's on screen, um, but she will become to be a character of interest in the show. But anyway, so she's not happy just as Luthen predicts to bring Cash in on board, but she does. And so she brings him back to camp. They kind of alter the story a little bit. Cass takes on a fake name to hide his identity. Um, Vel is very clear. We make no mentions of Luthen, no connections to him whatsoever. This is your story. Exactly what I tell you to do. Don't deviate from it, which... He kind of ends up doing in the long run anyway, but we'll get to that. And so anyway, so they get to camp again. They're three days from this job. Nobody trusts him. When he finds out the actual details of the job, he's like, what are we doing? This is a suicide mission. We're all going to die. Why are we doing this? Until he finds out this um, kind of wild card factor, which is this event of the Aldani people that they have consistently. It's called, it's called the eye, which is basically like a giant meteor shower that is like takes up the entire sky and that's he kind of cash and learns that this is going to be their plan to cover their escape basically is that they're going to do the heist at the time where the meteor shower is going to be just right that they can kind of sneak out now what he learns is they have a guy on the inside who's like this imperial dude that's got connections that basically he fell in love with an aldani local and then sounds like they probably unalived her and then he lost his taste for the empire after that so that's how he joined the rebellion and this is kind of another thing i really liked about this show is you have all these really personal stories of all these characters. I feel like it really humanizes the rebellion. Mm -hmm. um, we can get into this a little bit later, but there's there's a lot of really individual stories of how each of these characters got involved in the rebellion and why they're fighting the Empire. But anyway, so you have this really cool character named Nemec, who's got this whole like manifesto that he's writing. I'll come back to that later because he's a really cool character. Um, and then there's this other guy, um, Skeen, I think is his name, but mm -hmm. like... There's kind of some mistrust between him and Cashin from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's one other character that I can't remember his name, but he's the guy that kind of becomes in charge later. Um, so anyway, there's like, what is that? Six of them, I think, total. About, that yeah, like, yeah, There's going to be six that have to take on this entire garrison to steal a payroll for an entire sector. And Cashin's mm -hmm. like, what are we doing? We're going to die. Anyway, so... They drill and they kind of spend, we spend like two episodes, basically one episode is his introduction and then drilling to kind of get filled into the routine. And then the second episode is kind of the journey of getting there. And then by the third episode, we finally get to the heist. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to go off smoothly so far. We see kind of some hesitation from a few of the characters, um, but, you know, they kind of end up just going for it. It starts to go fine until there's like this other part of the garrison that suspects something's wrong and then they show up and then things kind of go crazy because the plan of these rebels was that nobody was going to have to die. They were going to get their stuff, get out. Everybody was going to be fine. Well, unfortunately, that's not what happens because there's this whole other troop that kind of, again, suspects that something's wrong, shows up. There's a firefight that happens. The fact that they're other leader is an imperial officer doesn't help them as much as they hoped it would and so they end up actually losing a few characters in the process but they do escape with a reasonable amount of credit I'll let yeah. oh yeah so of course as as jamie said like hey not no heist ever goes as planned and and bodies had to be dropped because again the the theme of the show is mess around and find out and apparently these rebels found out real quick that the empire was not one to play with and with that of course uh pretty much almost everybody yeah dies at the end well exception of of course cashin vel Cinta, and skeen who who survived until 
they get to the main checkpoint, they manage to escape Aldani and manage to get to the safety world, where Skeen uh, decides to betray everybody. Yeah. Uh, Skeen was like, hey, I'm going to take all these credits. I'm going to take this ship. I'm going to strand, uh, strand everybody else here. And you get to, and like, hey, you come with me because I know that you're just like me. You're using everybody to get to your own ends. And Kasten shoots him right in the face. Yes. Uh, of Shoot course, on sight. No hesitation. <laughs> yep, yep. Another perk of Kasten is uh, mm-hmm. he shoots first, asks questions never. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> because he and Skeen messed around and found out. Unfortunately, um, our boy Nimic, who had the manifesto that Jamie mentioned, he unfortunately passes away. Uh, but that kind of like sparks more of a rebellion into into Val, into really everybody really it's, it's angers everybody at the the isb the the empire to no end it's like and then and then we get introduced and we also get introduced to our girl daedra miro who again another another character who who we will emphasize of mess around and find out where <laughs> she's pretty much like trying to locate axis she's trying trying to climb up the axis the ladder of rank by trying to find Axis, who who we find out is Luthen, and and like him, and like trying to find him because she knows that like all of these uncoordinated attacks on the Empire is actually something more, and she thinks that like, it's a spark of a rebellion. So, and of course, she's getting resistance from her fellow peers, but she also got the support of her superior, who basically lets her go free reign to do whatever she wants and we kind of semi rooted for her while she's in while she's dealing with empire and then the next arc happens one thing we need to add about the last arc when nemec dies um he passes on his manifesto to Cass, and i think that's like a really important small moment because Cass doesn't want to take it immediately but he ends up taking it after vel insists and i think we see later on in the story that that's going to come around to impact Cass more than he thinks it's going to but Yes. Anyway, let's continue. So for before we get to the next arm arc, we have to get on program because this is the best arc in all of Star Wars, in my opinion. No um, doubt. TV show. So this is what I would call the Imperial Crackdown prison arc. This is elite storytelling, elite acting all throughout. So with that, uh, the heist is successful and Andor decides he wants to go to Florida to um, relax, <laughs> get away from the Empire. And with this, uh, the Empire is completely cracking down. Also on the side thing, something that a character that at first I was like, I don't care about this character, stop showing me, was like Senator, I forgot her last name. Senator Mon- Mothma, right? So Senator Mothma. So she is working with Luther in the background and she's like trying to fund essentially the uh, rebellion and she doesn't know about his big heist. So she's trying to like cover up her funds with the Ponzi scheme that's going on with laundering money and stuff like that. But also we find out, I believe in this art that she's also related to Vel, who is her cousin. Uh, So Mm -hmm. that was definitely shocking. So with the Imperial crackdown, um, ISB completely takes over all the sectors, raising taxes. People are getting arrested left and right for just like dumb stuff. And we'll get into just like the realness of this later, um, this entire show. So just with that, crack down, and then Andor gets himself in trouble again. Yeah. Uh, I will mention, too, one thing that's going to show up that kind of started showing up in the last arc and will show up as we kind of piece back and forth to Luthen specifically in this kind of middle arc is he has this really, really cool shop. That's got mm-hmm. all these really crazy Easter eggs in it. Yes. Um, that we'll talk about that later, but I had to throw that in now to make sure we didn't forget it. Anyway, so yeah, so Cass runs away thinking he's escaped. And then this is this is just kind of perfect cinematic irony, I guess, is what that would be. That like he escapes getting caught for being part of a rebellious act and then basically gets arrested on this other planet for being in the wrong place at the wrong time in while Florida. people are being basically accused of insurrection against the empire. So it's funny because he kind of gets arrested for doing a lesser version of what he did, except he wasn't actually guilty of it at the time he got arrested. But anyway, so he gets arrested and gets sentenced to like six years or whatever of prison. And then he gets sent to this place called Narkina five, right? Which they show up. And the first thing you see is like, 
the people that work there are wearing shoes, but the prisoners aren't wearing any shoes. And then you learn that basically the floors are like electric floors. And so they basically electrocute the prisoners into submission, which is wild. Um, anyway, and so it's just this really regimented, strict um, prison system where you find out that they're building something like they spend their entire day. It's basically prison labor. They spend all of their days working and building things which of course you would have to be totally completely new to star wars to not immediately recognize they're probably building death star pieces because what else is the empire building at this time anyway so they're building these giant almost wagon wheel looking things without the wheel but anyway so they spend their whole day trying to be the table that gets the most of these little wagon wheel spire things shipped out to go send the empire. And I think it's, they have some rule that the table that performs the least gets like electrocuted at the end of the day, which again, like just a lot of pain motivation here in this prison. Um, But when Cass gets assigned to his floor, we meet the next kind of set of really cool characters. Most notably, we have Kino Loy, who is, I'm sure, a fan favorite Andy Serkis. We love him from Lord of the Rings. We love him from Marvel. He's now in Star Wars. He's everywhere. He's great. Venom director. (laughs) <laughs> yes. his first ever star wars appearance oh yes his first ever star wars appearance <laughs> yes so he's yeah he's basically the kind of person that's in charge of this prison floor that's driving cast it's driving all these other guys to kind of keep their production up um and he kind of seems like this character that's just obsessed with kind of staying on target and staying focused on what they need to do. We'll kind of see that change as the art continues, but we see kind of Cass and a couple of his other friends, I guess you could say at this prison start right away to try to figure out, okay, how do I get out of this place? Mm -hmm. And this whole thing intensifies one night when we, we see that they, the prisoners kind of have this way of sending messages to each other kind of through sign language through the different levels. Cause there's like what, seven different levels and like, 100 or 200 like men per level or something like that so there's lots of these shifts in this prison and so they kind of communicate what's going on to each other and one night you just like see they're waiting to be let off the bridge which is like where they wait between where they work and where they go sleep and so they're waiting and then just all the power shuts down and everybody starts freaking out and then the power immediately turns back on and then everybody's screaming something's really wrong at level two and like everybody's freaking out and Kino, of course, again, focused on just saying, it's like, everybody forget about it. Just stay on program, stay focused, and let's just, whatever. Now, what we end up finding out, again, there's this uh, character, Olaf, who's another one of the fellow prisoners that's working. He's kind of an older guy. Mm-hmm. Um, poor poor Olaf, unfortunately, um, does not survive the story arc. He kind of, again, he's older. He's being subject to strenuous work all day. Um Given that I'm a medical student, I have to say he must have some cardiovascular disease because that's what ends up happening. He has. And he gets electrocuted. Yeah, well, yes, he gets electrocuted, which doesn't help. He ends up having a stroke um, during his, like, and there, it's really sad because they make some big deal over he has like five shifts left or something. So they're just trying to get him through to when he should be released. And then he has a stroke. And so you have Cass and Kino or with Olaf, and they bring in this medical character who they learn from this medical character that. Basically, what happened the day before was that somebody who was supposed to be released got released from a different level and ended back up on a different level. And they fried, like completely killed two whole ships, which is 100 men just to cover it up. And so these characters learn we're never getting out of here. When we are getting released, air quotes, they're really sending us to another prison. And so that's really the spark. It's a really cool moment for Kino, actually, because yeah. Cass has been bugging him repeatedly for the last, like, I don't know, a couple episodes about how many men are there on each level at any given time, like how many people do you have to oppose, like whatever. And then this kind of when Olaf dies, when he finds out they're never getting out, that's kind of the moment for him that he's like, there's never more than 12 guards on a level at each time. And then him and Cass have this really, really cool kind of dialogue that Kino obviously will take with him later where Cass again is trying to convince him no we have a plan it has to be tomorrow that we get out when they bring in a new man to replace Olaf and Cass has this really really cool quote that's something like I'd rather what is it I'd rather die um fighting them than like doing their will or something like that um so really cool motivational thing and so they decide from that moment when they get back to the floor and everybody's like what happened why is Olaf gone that's like kind of their catalyst moment of like, okay, we're doing this. Regardless of what happens, Kino has this quote of, I'm going to consider myself already dead. So whatever happens from here, 
let's just make it look good tomorrow and we're getting out basically so mm-hmm. go ahead uh, go on, I missed. <laughs> yep yep yeah yep. oh man this again this is peak uh but once we get into that arc right well now everything is is going sideways for for the uh for the empire at this point because mm-hmm. or at least at the prison because of the fact that like all right Cass, he he finally was able to like set off the the motions in order to to break out of course flooding the floor so that way it short circuits the electric floors and it was like boom all right no more electricity now that the guards who are never more than 12 will have to like fire upon them Cass is able to grab a blaster from one kill the guards and then let every single prisoner up and then of course arm them with weapons and it just keeps snowballing as all the other other prisoners go to the different floors, freeze each floor as they all get that spark. So everybody is now escaping, causing the Empire to cry in the corner like a bunch of cowards. <laughs> uh, so it, it was very, very cathartic. Uh, but that's also uh, punctuated by Kino's speech that he gives to each prisoner in the control center. And it was perhaps one of the best speeches ever because of the fact like this man who was just trying, he was just trying his best to to leave only to realize there's no hope. So he's like, mm-hmm. nah, I'm going to take this hope. So and yeah. I'm going to empower everybody as a boss to to be free. I was mm-hmm. legit getting emotional because of just like how he started. Um Cassian was like, you have to be the one to give the speech. It can't be me. Mm-hmm. And then he started off and it was like, Cassian was like, that's it. Cause he was like, just like nervous. He didn't know what to say. Like he couldn't believe it. And then as the just speech builds and you see the other like uh, prisoners reacting, like uh, I remember just like the old guy that was like head of the night shift. Like he puts his feet on the floor and he sees it's not, um, it's not going to fry them. And then uh, Kino is just like, yo, if you fall down, pick somebody up, keep going, just keep climbing one way out, one way out. And then it just builds and builds until they get to like the escape, uh, the escape Mm -hmm. essentially, but they have to jump. And it's the most heartbreaking scene because he's like, I can't swim. And like, that's the only way you're going to get to freedom. You have to jump into the water. I guess we forgot to mention that this prison is in the middle of an ocean. So yeah, that's an important detail. Completely in the middle. So like, it's swimmable to land, but if like you can't swim, you can't get it. Um, just to fill out in the periphery, uh, we learn again Bella's cousin to the senator. Bix gets taken because uh, the Imperials are really like on Ferrix now, and they know that that's where Cassian is originally from. Our good friend Cyril, who we're going to talk about, is just like doing his best to kind of find Cassian. He's getting on people's nerves, and just to end this arc, episode ten. Luthen gave the best speech in all of Star Wars. Period. The he like uh so we find out that one of the Imperials is like a spy that Luthen trained and he was trying to get out and Luthen was like no you're not getting out. <laughs> like that's not happening at home boy. And he was like cuz we we trained you too hard you're too much of an investment we're not going to let you go. And the dude asked him what are you sacrificing? And Luthen is like bet let me tell you what I'm sacrificing. And just like the different things he was saying, the speech kept building upon itself where essentially it's like, I'm becoming a monster so I can take down monsters. I will not see the sunset of what I'm fighting for. Like that was like, wow. Because he was like, I got rid of my humanity just so other people can have like a decent life that I will never ever experience. So that was, that was wild. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Pain- yeah, I feel like, well, and just to kind of add one, one last point on Kino's speech, too, I thought it was really cool that it came back full circle. And the quote that Cass used to motivate him to buy in was the quote that Kino then used to motivate the rest of the prison to buy in. So that was kind of a really cool connection moment for them. But, okay, we can't move on until we talk about a couple other things from this arc. One, I do want to expand a little bit on the Mon Mothma piece, and then... Of course, we're going to come back to Cyril in a second because yeah. he has one of the our worst, guys. our favorite um, worst scenes, I think, in the entire show for many reasons. Anyway, so Mon Mothma, 
we see that Mon Mothma starts to really figure out she's in trouble. She's been trying to move kind of her family's fortune um, to assist the rebellion. And she's got like 4,000, 400,000 credits that are missing. And so we see her. She's And, you know, what's interesting about Mon Mothma, we find out she has a daughter. She has a husband that they have a really interesting relationship with. It doesn't seem like it's kind of a very loving marriage but it also kind of there's this implication throughout the show that chandrilla just has these really different customs so which we can get into that later because i think that's really interesting but she has this childhood friend that she calls on that they're obviously still very close and buddy buddy um but he fortunately for her is somebody who's kind of mentally leaning towards kind of thoughts of rebellion right and so without outrightly stating it they basically kind of end up building this partnership to help her move money. And that's all he knows. He doesn't know anything else. He just knows he's helping her move money that she says is for this charitable fund. Now he pulls in this other guy who she absolutely cannot stand. Um, And I can't remember. Davos Golden. That's his name. Davos Mm -hmm. Golden. So she pulls in Davo, who apparently she, or he pulls um, Davo in and she thinks he's a thug and there's this whole thing. So they have this meeting where Davo offers, okay, we can do this business. It's your money. I can move it. We can just do it discreetly. So it's fine. And she's like, there's got to be a cost. And he's like, no, there's no cost. Actually, turns out he just wants an introduction of his son with her daughter that are similar age. And so Mon Mothma is basically being asked to use her daughter as a bargaining piece to get what she needs, which is like, she's like, no, absolutely. I'm not going to do that. And he has this really interesting, wow that's the first untrue thing you've said all day. And then that's kind of where it leaves. And so she's left with this really heavy decision of like, for the sake of the rebellion, do I sacrifice my daughter for this purpose? And so it's kind of an interesting development going on there and not, not sacrifice in that sense of like, her daughter's not going to die, but it's like this basically arranged forced mar- marriage. Arranged. Yeah. yeah. Forced marriage. So she has this really interesting decision to make now. Hmm. Moving on to our boy, so, the goat. <laughs> I just have to say, first of all, I this may or may not need a trigger warning in advance of it because I'm going to oh. talk on things very directly touching to symptoms and environments that lead to domestic violence and sexual assault. So there's a trigger warning right there for you if you need it. Um. So Cyril, gosh. <laughs> Okay, so Dedra brings him in for questioning because he signs off on this report of what happened with Cashin and Ferrix, right? And so apparently we know that Cyril never saw the report because they weren't given an option to see it by Blevin. And um, Dedra ends up taking over Ferrix from Blevin, who's this other supervisor guy. Anyway, so they bring in Cyril for questioning based on the report. And he's like, well, I never saw it. And so they're like, okay, they have him read the report and kind of report his discrepancies, whatever. Dedra is very clear, like, this is an interrogation. I'm taking this over. You're going to drop it and move on. Like you have no part in this moving forward. Now, this man who clearly has some kind of inferiority complex or something. I don't know. He's well, okay. And we we need to add like, he's like living with his mom after he got fired. He, which they, their family has a very like Godfather-esque vibe Mama. to it. It's very weird. Yes. Anyway, so Cyril basically turns into a stalker. Um, and this is, there's a lot of really, really dangerous things in this scene that I'm going to talk about. And this is why I didn't want to let it go. Um, because we see him literally like waiting for Dedra to show up at her work. So like he's, and, and she kind of asked him about it and he's like, well, I, I know that you come here. Like he literally watches for when she comes and like purposefully goes and puts himself in her way. And so they have this kind of interaction and she's like, why are you here? I told you to leave it. And he like seems to think that she had something to do with this promotion that she has. So in his mind, he's going to thank her for a promotion or whatever. But she's very clearly uncomfortable. Okay. She's very obviously not happy with the situation. And um, so anyway, so she challenges him. She's like, I had nothing to do with that. You need to drop it and move on. And I told you like, and you know, when she basically asked him if he's stalking her and he's like, well, yeah, I like know where you come. She's like, I am an ISB supervisor. Like, this is not okay. I could have you put in a cage in the outer rim if I wanted to. Like, basically this is her threatening, like, this is the power that I have. You need to back off. And I think what's really important to recognize about this scene from a woman's perspective, what happens here is Dedra realizes that it doesn't matter how much power that she has in the ISB, it doesn't make her untouchable in this situation. She still is not safe from this man. 
because what he does immediately afterwards, like he's not threatened off by that scene. He has this really weird, he's like projected onto her this like idealism of how like she's this paragon of like beauty and justice and like what there is to fight for in the empire or something. And he like fixates on her. He has a very obsessive personality. Honestly, he like fixates on her as this object. And and really that's what she is to him at this point. She becomes an object to him for him to fixate on. And she tries to move on and he physically grabs her and stops her. So again, this is a very dangerous, dangerous situation because again, uh, I promise you, she's terrified in this moment. And we see that kind of in the scenes that come afterwards. But he's literally behaving in a way that's like, it's like he feels he has this entitlement to her. Um, and we'll touch back on this kind of at the end, because I think there's another scene that supports this. But this whole scene in general, just I think it really shows Dedra that like, OK, it doesn't matter that I'm a super high ranking officer. Like, I'm still not safe. Um, mm-hmm. to just like be here and so that's a really really important like everything in that scene is kind of exactly the setup of really a potential for either if if that were to become a future relationship well he's a stalker right so this is the potential for things like sexual assault domestic violence like that's how situations arise in real life that's what it looks like and so I'm curious where they're going to take these two characters because like that whole scene, it was in episode nine, just in case anybody's curious, that whole scene in its entirety is just completely problematic. So that's my spiel on that. Cool. cool. Definitely just like cool to see that different perspective. Uh, And then just wrapping up as we go into the next arc, uh, it's essentially uh, Marva, his Cassian's adopted mom has died. So he does what, everyone does in these movies or tv shows where you go back to when everyone is watching you when someone's died and essentially it's it's a very it builds to a powder keg where marva is give her not her ghost but she has a projection um, before she dies that yes a hologram that gives a speech and it's just a really cool scene um everyone comes back to ferrix cassian's there luthan's there and they're trying to kill cassian and then just with that marva's speech causes essentially all the people of Ferrix, well, not all, but a lot of people of Ferrix to rebel against the ISB. And just going from there, it's just like kind of ending, if you want to take it there. Pandemonium. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I think parts that I really liked about these final two episodes, um, first of all, it was like the way that Cass kind of learned that his mom died was really rough because he like calls, even when he knows it's unsafe to send a message to her. And then um, Zan, I think is who answered. And he was like, Oh, Cass, you don't know, like your mom's dead. And then Cass of course shouldn't come back, but he ends up coming back because it's his mom. Um, But what I really liked in the final episode, kind of in the buildup to everything that happens in the final act of the show is you have Nemec's manifesto playing kind of over the scenes as they build over basically Pac's son who Pax is like the other guy that was working with Bix um, that basically was taken and killed by the Empire because he was the one that had the line of communication to Luthen. And so you have Pax's son who's basically building a bomb um, that it's playing over that. And then you have um, Bix who's sitting in prison after being tortured and like the manifesto is playing over that and then you even have Cass kind of walking around because Cass is the one who has a manifesto and he's kind of playing it and he's listening to it and there's this really interesting kind of moment of things coming together for a few of these characters because you know Cass earlier when he had tried to convince Marva to leave with him Marva was like no the rebellion's here I'm gonna be part of the rebellion like she's fired up to be part of it and it's ironic because Cass was literally part of it and he's like well he doesn't say that he is but like she's super fired up and inspired by it but he's like no what are you talking about we have to run away and so he's still kind of in this I gotta run away mindset but anyway we get to kind of this moment where you have all of these different characters kind of have this coming together for them. And what I love about Nemec's manifesto is you have these really cool kind of words about how rebellion builds slowly. Like it's not one specific thing. It's all of these, it's the accumulation of the waves continually crashing of these different acts of rebellion until finally one day there's going to be a straw that breaks and it's not going to be enough because, and he has this really cool quote of how basically freedom is what's natural. Freedom doesn't take effort, but 
tyranny. Tyranny requires constant effort and control is not natural. So it requires this constant effort and they're always afraid of losing their control. So the more we just push back in little increments, it'll eventually kind of collapse and give way. And that's basically what you see at the end of this show. So I really liked that build up into it, but we get into kind of the final act where um, Cass decides, he finds out Bix has been taken and she's still alive. He yeah, basically decides that he has to go save Bix. And so that's kind of why he ends up staying. You have Dedra has showed up. Luthen showed up. Dedra wants Cass alive. Luthen wants Cass dead, obviously. Um, but I kind of think that he doesn't based on some things that he has previously in the show. But anyway, got Marva in the middle that has this really awesome last final speech that ends up in this massive um, conflict between the Imperials and the people of Ferrix where Paxton kind of sets his bomb off and then you have this whole big fighting. Dedra ends up in the middle of it and she gets taken and this is kind of the scene I was talking about earlier where Cyril decides he has to save her but saves her by picking up a gun and putting it to her back and bringing her to this other room. And again, I promise you, when she says I should say thank you, the conflict that she's feeling in that moment is I am terrified, one, because I just had a near-death experience, but two, because I'm in an extremely dangerous situation with you. And okay. now this man is going to feel some entitlement to me because he saved me and I'm quote unquote in his debt. With this scene, this is how I read it. She was terrified because like what she said earlier, like she doesn't have the control. But when he puts the gun, how I saw it was that he was pretending to be a rebel yeah. and yeah. having a yes. gun to her back. Okay, so we're in agreement yes. with that. Yes. And then yeah. she was just in shock, not like I'm taking you yeah. hostage. So. Yes, yes. But yeah, and I think some of her terror is like, again, it's not it's not gratitude that she feels in that moment. She and I think that's why she says what she says. She says, I should say thank you. It's not because she's just saying thank you for saving me. It's I should say thank you. But I'm still I know the danger of the situation that I'm in right now, because you've already shown me that you're dangerous. And so now there's going to be this extra level of he feels some entitlement to her because she owes him, quote unquote. But so I'm not really sure where that's going to go. I know there's people that like we're saying that that scene had sexual tension in it. That's not sexual tension. That's like terror of I am not safe and I need to get out. Um. Anyway, so yeah, so Cass ends up rescuing Bix and getting her onto a ship with Brasso. I really love Brasso. Brasso is kind of like an unsung hero in the story. Really love that character. Um, Pac's son and then another one of the daughters of Ferrix, who's the organization that Cass's mom was a part of. And they escape. And there's this really sweet moment of like, Bix is like, no, Cass will find us. Wherever we go, Cass will find us. So Cass ends up going and finds Luthen because he, he sees that Luthen's there. He ends up back in Luthen's ship and Luthen's like, you're a hard man to kill. And he's like, well, I'm going to make it easy now. You either kill me or you take me in. And like, this is basically the origin of how Cass joined the rebellion. So that's yeah. what we're at. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then, of course, we got a post credit scene as always where you see exactly that the machinery was used to build the Death Star. And I also want to mention that uh, Marva died a death that not many in Star Wars get. Death via old age. Yeah. That's peaceful. True. Peaceful death. The, the, the good kind of death. Um, don't don't think uh, you, you get that that often. It's either you get lightsabered or you get uh, thrown somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. So we think we're in our next section, we're going to kind of get into uh, what went right. So we can cover that then. So just for time's sake, we can get straight into our awards. And kicking off the awards, I am going with the op of the year. So I remember the very first episode, Meech, I texted you and I was like, is this tight one like a big op or whatever and you're like no wait till episode three then come text me and then i got to episode three and i was like okay i think i know who you're talking about but i feel like something else is going to happen so is it like he uh is it somebody else or does he go on his shigaraki arc and get more powerful and you were just like just keep watching uh but with this this is going <laughs> it's the first one but it's a co-op of the year because Dedra is the more dangerous of the ops and more powerful one. But Ciro embodies the, the persona of an op, of not letting it go, of just like continuing after Andor endlessly. Like he literally gets fired. And like what you talked about earlier, where he um he just keeps going after it, keeps sending reports, sending reports to the point where they're like, yo, stop. Like he even goes to like the uh, the funeral scene with um, Sergeant Moss, which is a really funny scene. And 
like they like have their hats together and everything and he like yo i'm looking for you uh and or so it's just like the not letting it go embodies the definition of an op so dj and most importantly cyril come get the op of the year award and and cyril you, you might as well just stay up for these next awards because i already know what's about to happen Let's let's go ahead and get it with our newest award, the Simp of the Year Award. Uh, and again, Cyril, you 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 know, you know, you out here was so enamored by Daedra, so much so that she was disturbed by your behavior and the fact you stalked this woman at her job. I don't know anybody else who would do that, <laughs> sir. Oh, oh, and let's keep on going with. uh with how you saved her and the fact you had that look in your eye that was just oh nah oh nah you have a problem so sir so sir just stay up here for your simp of the year award okay so the first award that i want to give out um is i don't know maybe a new award uh i'm gonna give out the take me there award um, because, and I'm going to give this to Luthen shop specifically, I kind of mentioned it earlier, but there's so many just little fun things in there. Um, there's, I mentioned Padme's my favorite character. So Padme's headdress from episode two is in there. There's a Gungan shield from episode one that's in there. There's like the little tablets from the world between worlds episode of star Wars rebels. That's in there. There's Sith holocrons. There's Jedi holocrons. There's star killers armor. There's just so many really exciting Easter eggs in there. And actually that Starkiller one was confirmed by an article that's on StarWars.com. Fun fact, so that's official. They also mentioned there's like the little stones from Indiana Jones that are in there somewhere too. So the you know Star Wars kind of considers wow. or continues its classic pulling in of other kind of Lucasfilm related worlds, but also just bigger connections to the Star Wars universe. So if I could visit anywhere in the show, that's that's where I would go. Take me there. All right. And for our next award, it's the You Was Really Spitting Award. So at the uh, in the One Way Out episode, this would have went to one person, but then the person after it literally gave one of the best speeches I've ever heard. So Luthen, come get the You Was Really Spitting Award because this was just like moving in so many ways, um, really laying out the costs of rebellion. I think a lot of times we just see that, okay, yes, we're rebelling, freedom, yada, 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 let's take down the empire. But he just really outlaid what it takes to lead a rebellion and to like hold it together. So Luthen, he was really spent. Ah, yes. And our next award is the Stealing Money Award, an award that goes to any actor who just comes up on the scene and just steals every scene that they're in. I got to give it to Andy Serkis as Kino. Like, my mans went through it, that whole arc. You saw his development change from a man who's just trying to make it through. You saw all the hope in his eyes only to get it destroyed uh, and then see it spark a light of rebellion. And only Andy Serkis could, could pull off that range of emotion. Uh, I would love to see see Kino return in more episodes. I would love to see Andy Serkis return in episodes because uh, I'm, I'm surprised this was his only appearance. So, Andy Circus, please just come come get this award. Okay, so next, I'm going to give out the biggest idiot award. You guys already know where it's going. This is going to Cyril Karn. I just, your behavior is unacceptable. Like, I, you, I'll, I guess I can get into this now. I feel like there's a good comparison we can make between Dedra and Cyril about like their methods and kind of the way they went about it. I think you could argue that Cyril was an obsessive guy who tried to force too much, who couldn't let things go, whereas Dedra was persistent and was, you know, ambitious and aggressive, but she was very methodical and very wise about how she did it. So Cyril, you just you had no methods for what you were trying to do. The things that you did were completely unacceptable. Like, and you caused way more problems than you should have. And you should have just listened to your supervisor in the first place. So you are the biggest idiot in the show. 
come come get your award. Yes, and of course we can't go anywhere without the Black Air Force Award. The the award that goes to one of the biggest menaces in this whole show. A man who does whatever it takes. A man who's willing to drop bodies with no regard to life and without a second thought. Cassian Andor, this one is yours, sir. Because just from the very beginning, when you just shot them shot that one cop, it's like, hey, hey, I won't tell nobody. Blam! He he was out of there. When we saw Skeen was about to rat out to the his old group, bam, dead, gone. All the bodies you caught in episode three alone, you took out basically a whole battalion of cops, sir. And that's just trying to leave. And and you made Cyril, the, the best character in the whole show, look like a total uh, incompetent fool. And... Or really, Cyril did it to himself. But uh, we're, we're not gonna we're not gonna get into the, the politics because you you deserve this Black Air Force Award. Come get your forces, and we'll see you for season two in twenty twenty four. Okay, so we have one more award to give out. This one's really tough for me actually because I've got three people that I'm toying with for this award. So I'm gonna give out the Low Key Genius Award, and I almost feel like I have to split it a couple ways um because see i'm weighing between luthan mon mothma and dedra actually i think one of these characters really deserves this award i think i'm I'm probably going to split it between mon mothma and dedra for specific reasons well mon mothma she's i feel like she's a lot more brilliant than she lets on and she even has this whole monologue in one of the episodes that like the the mon mothma that everybody thinks she is it's totally an act it's a fake so it hides what she's really doing um and she says she learned from palpatine and we know palpatine's a genius so anyway she's she's learned from the master himself she's she even has this really cool moment in one of the last two episodes where she picks up perrin from whatever he's doing her husband the and then she picks him up gambling now this is important because she gets a new driver at some point and she's convinced that he's spying on her, right? And she turns out to be correct. So I'm pretty sure her move here is because she knows that there's 400,000 credits that are missing. She knows that's about to be found out. So she picks a fake fight with her husband about his gambling problem to try to kind of have her driver take away this as the reasoning that she's got 400,000 credits missing instead of the fact that she's fueling the rebellion. It's brilliant. It's a really, really small moment. You blink and you miss it. But I think Mon Mothma definitely is deserving of this award. Additionally, kind of started to talk about Dedra, but I think Dedra is a lot smarter than everybody gives her credit for. She's clearly the most competent person in the ISB supervisor room. Um, she gets a lot of respect from kind of the head of the supervisor room as well, because she's willing to pay attention to things that people are just either too lazy to or not willing to pay attention to. She's the one that figures out what Luthen is doing and the fact that he even exists. She doesn't identify him per se, but she figures out what he's doing. She's able to kind of put in a plan that captures a line of communication to him because that's how we end up with all of the mess on Ferrix in the first place, really, after everything with Cyril. Um, and she's really wise and methodical about it. She had some really cool scenes about how, like, she mentions, so with Spellhouse, for example, that raid where they kill everybody, she's like, no, like, somebody should have been in the room saying that we don't get anything from a dead body. Like, we need a witness to interrogate or we don't learn anything. And so she's very, like, she is very much the type to pay attention to what's going on, to be observant about what's around her, to be ambitious, but not to be overzealous. I think there's an important difference there. So I got to also give. Dedra, um, the low key genius award here. All right. Now that awards have been handed out, we are going to get into our tiers. So Meech, can you read it off for us? Uh, yes. So in terms of our tiers, of course, we have the F tier, which is caught and sent to the gulag. And then for our D tier, we have forging your parents' signature. If you know, you know. Uh, yes. And then for your C tier, we got the wet bandits. It, Shout out to all our Home Alone crew. <laughs> and then for our B tier, we have Ocean's Eleven. For our A tier, 
It's Bilbo stealing from Smog. Mm-hmm. And then finally, for our S tier, the Mona Lisa. If you know, you know. So, Jamie, what what would you like to give this movie? Um, you know, this show was a pleasant surprise to me because, again, out of the shows that Star Wars had coming out, this wasn't really the one I was excited for. Um, I liked Cash In a lot. Rogue One, I think, is the best movie that Disney has put out. So I, I do like his character, but Andor as a show, I like wasn't totally bought into it yet. But it ended up being a lot better in a lot of ways than I than I thought it was going to be. So I think I'll give it I'll give it an A tier on this. Not not quite S tier, but I'll give it an A tier. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Demetrius? You know, I don't like giving out S's. Um, but when it got to the Aldani and the prison art. I was like, I need a season two right now. Uh, This is an S tier show, in my opinion, just because it's so different. Um, Maybe that's why I just feel like hype, a lot of hype behind it. But it's like just good on like a lot of different levels of character growth, of just like the plot and just even taking it different. I feel like for this particular show, I felt more concerning the plot rather than I did just like with Mandalorian, which I absolutely love. I feel like it's a lot of character building and just like the relationships that I love with this. I felt like I felt the struggle of the characters and like against the empire. So I'm giving an S tier. Nice. Nice. And for myself, I would have to give it none other than Bilbo still in from smog, the A tier. That was a fantastic show. I thought it was really great. Uh, of course, the tone of it completely different from anything that came before. Closest would actually be Rogue One, which is the sequel. And I really do think like, hey, I am definitely anticipating the uh, second season and looking forward to that and how that directly leads into that uh, movie. And just, yeah, I think it was a really great, really phenomenal season. Uh, yeah, nothing more to say here. Nice. So after that, we are going to have a our random fan theory, but then also do a deeper dive on uh, just what we thought about the show and where to go from here from Star Wars. So, but first we're going to hit you with our sponsor for the day. The sponsors for today's video is none other than the Sons of Ferrix. Created in honor of the Daughters of Ferrix and Marva, we created a certain program for our males of society in order to fight against those filthy Imperials. Please, if you're a citizen of Ferrix and you would like to join this fabulous organization where we strive for excellence in Ferrix culture, Ferrix pride, and uh, Imperial hatred, then please come on in. We promise that we will train you in the ways of wielding blasters. We promise to raise you in the ways of making Imperials as mad as humanly possible and eventual elimination. So please come join us now. All right, go on. Thanks for that. Now we are going to get into one of our favorite segments when we have a guest on our random fan theory of the week. So, Jamie, what you got for us? Okay, so I have a couple things related to Andor, which is, side note, why we're doing this at the end instead of the beginning of the show. Um, So I've got two big ones, really, that I'm kind of nursing right now. And the first one is pertaining to Luthen. So with Luthen, he's this new character, but I feel like he has to be like a major, he is a major character in the show, obviously, but I feel like he's, he's another one that has to have major connections. Like we saw that Vel is Mon Mothma's cousin and that's her connection. But I feel like just looking at Luthen's shop and the fact that he kind of collects all the things that he does, the persona that he has when he's on Coruscant, I feel like he has to be like from Naboo because that's kind of like, you know, the the Naboo are very like obsessed with culture and the arts. And that seems to really fit with the vibe he has going in his shop. Um, And we know that he has like these collections from all around the Empire or the Republic, obviously, at the time he probably started it. Um. And a lot of these are kind of, some of them are like force related things. Like we see Plo Koon's mask at one point, again, the world between worlds tablets and a few other things like that. Mm-hmm. But he's obviously also very like well connected. Like he seems like he has a lot of money and resources and influence. Now, if we put those two things together, 
what families do we know from Naboo that are like major, influential, significantly wealthy houses? Well, we know of Padme's family, which is a Nayberry family, but the other one we know of is the Palpatines. And mm. so I have this theory. And again, I have to preface when they made Rhea Palpatine, I thought that was the stupidest thing ever. But with Lupin, oh, they did? I, I never saw those movies. Exactly. <laughs> With I didn't Lupin, know those movies existed. That's crazy. I think it would be really interesting oh if he God. was like the brother of Palpatine. I think that would be a really interesting development. And I think a lot of it fits actually the way they did it. Now, this could be one of those things that I just kind of hoped for it, but I don't know if they'll actually go there. Yes, we know in the extended universe that Palpatine killed his whole family, but this is Disney and they threw the extended universe out the window. Additionally, it wouldn't be the first time that somebody was supposed to be dead and they weren't, right? So I just have this theory, like, especially Palpatine. with Luthen's, yeah, especially with Luthen's speech that he gave. And exactly. Like, this is not the first team of Palpatine was supposed to be dead and then wasn't. So anyway, um, I just have this theory, especially with the speech where he talks about, like, how he has to use the weapons of his enemy to defeat them. The fact that he came up with this equation 15 years ago is what he said, which technically is the year before the Empire even started. Who better would know his enemy who i guess at this point technically is the empire but who is the empire the embodiment of well it's the embodiment of the emperor which is palpatine who better to know palpatine than his brother and it's interesting because even the way he's cast if you put ian mcdarmid and still on skarsgård next to each other they could pass for relatives right if we're talking actors and so even the way that he dresses in a few scenes i'm like mm, this has got palpatine vibes to it so this could just be something i'm really hoping for but I mean, he's got knowledge of kyber crystals. He's got Force-sensitive, like, things or, like, Force-related objects that he's got in his shop. I'm not saying he has to be a Force user because I think we that, that he doesn't need to be a Force user. But if his brother's Palpatine, that should probably teach him enough about Force-wielding beings. But I just really think it'd be a very, very interesting direction for Luthen to be the brother of Palpatine. And basically, he's kind of taken it on his shoulders to sacrifice his humanity to like basically become the monster that his brother is to defeat him. I think that's a really interesting direction they could go. Additionally, <clears throat> I was really getting from Clea, his assistant, in the way that she dresses and even the symbol that she like used to meet up with Vel. I was almost getting some like Crimson Dawn type vibes. And it's been a while since we've had that. Like they kind of established it at the end of Solo that like Maul's running Crimson Dawn, Crimson Dawn's this organization, and you have like Kira that's like overdoing whatever, but they haven't really come back to it. So I think it'd be really interesting if somehow Crimson Dawn has different ties to the rebellion. So those are kind of my two theories that I have working on Andor right now. Luthen's the one that I'm like kind of most hoping is the way that it goes. But either way, I think Luthen has to be some majorly important influential character. So that's what I got for you. 